we are going to give it another minute or two just so that everyone gets a chance to join us in case there are a couple of stragglers. Again, for anybody who's joining right now, we are just going to start the webinar in another, let's say, two minutes to give everybody an opportunity to kind of uh, join in just in case anyone is uh, running a few minutes late. All right. We are now three minutes past the hour, and I wanted to welcome everybody to the Stepping Up to Legal Digital Transformation um, uh, panel session. I was about to call it a webinar, not quite a webinar, but uh, pretty close. And, and again, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, with that, first thing on the agenda is if I would like to just introduce the panel session today, and you see everybody kind of live just above uh, above the, the session there. So why don't we start with a couple of introductions. Let me start myself. Uh, my name is Charles Dimov. I'm the Vice President of Marketing, Global Marketing for Contract Pod AI. We are a contract a life cycle management uh, solution provider. And, um, you know, we are just introducing new, new, new aspects to contract management all the time. So very, very exciting time for us. Um, specifically, actually interesting time also in this uh, COVID pandemic that we're all going through, all, all of us are suffering through. Um, and specifically, it's interesting because, frankly, it makes us all stop and really think about the digital transformation side and starting to say, hey, you know, if this is a prolonged time period that we're going through. This is definitely a, a crux for change. Um, you know, how is this affecting the industry? How is this affecting legal in general, corporate legal, et cetera? So again, makes this a very, very poignant topic and, uh, you know, excellent to have our panelists on this. With that, Matt, can I ask you to introduce? Thank you, Charles. Hi, I'm Matt Gould. I am the head of legal and also the head of the uh, legal transformation team for Contract Pod AI. So uh, I'm a qualified lawyer and run the in house legal team, um, but I also run the transformation team, which consists of legal technologists um, and experts in the transformation field um, to help people on their digital journey. Um, I'm a solicitor by background. Um, I spent many years as general counsel for the EMEA region for Telstra. Um, Australia's uh, largest um, multinational communications company. So um, uh, I'm a commercial lawyer, um, but also have a deep interest in um, in legal technology. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Michael. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Charles. Um, hello, everybody. Michael Green. I'm the GM of legal for uh, Zero, uh, the UK and EMEA business. Um, Zero is a small business uh, accounting and financial platform. Um, 
Uh, we were born in the cloud about 12 years ago, based in New Zealand. Uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm a Kiwi. Um, I moved over to the UK to hit up the uh, UK legal team in 2017, right as GDPR was on the horizon, PST2 on open banking, um, and Brexit was looming. So it's been quite the road right over the last two years, um, but have a deep interest in um, uh, technology and the way that we can use that to create efficiencies and scale. Um, and so that's why I'm here today. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And Gordon. Thanks, Charles. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gordon Youngson. I am responsible for APAC and Europe at Transwise. And I've been in financial services for probably 15 years. I've been at Transwise two and a half years, and it's um, it's an exciting company to work for. It's, it's full of technology and like driving for change. And I'm very keen on like transformational projects. We're going through some interesting projects at the moment, that's why to try and improve and uh, streamline how legal do things. So excited to be here and talking about this today. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. That's excellent. Good. So with that, let me just start off on kind of saying a couple of the key discussion topics that we are going to chat about today are going to be, uh, you know, where does legal stand in relationship to digital transformation? You know, what's taking place on that side? Um, I do want to talk about what, what are some of the current obstacles? We might as well kind of face them, take a look at them and say, what are they and are there ways around them? And also quick and effective transformation techniques uh, that in other words, some of the best practices that maybe some of our colleagues are already using, whether it be on the panel or even if we've heard about others and certainly from the audience, not uh, wouldn't mind at all hearing from the audience as well on that topic. Um, now, before we get started, there are just uh, two more things that I, I kind of wanted to throw up there. I love getting the ball rolling just with a couple of stats. So this is actually coming from a recent Gartner study on legal automation. And it showed that 89% reported that their organizations met or exceeded expected ROI, which is pretty interesting given that um, that basically means that generally speaking, when you are deploying a legal automation system, whether it's a contract lifecycle management system or another aspect of automation, um, it means that typically you're going to see a, a positive ROI out of this, which is very, very, you know, it, it speaks very well to kind of that, that stepping stone of digital transformation overall for the legal business. And the second thing was interesting as well out of that same study was they also kind of asked executives, not the legal team, but the other executives on the senior leadership team about um, you know, their feelings. And 73% came back and said, uh, of the executives said that they were extremely open to investments specifically in legal for legal automation, contract automation, those type of technologies. So again, pretty interesting stat to start off with because I think a lot of times in the um, uh, legal profession, there is a, a, a sense of feeling that the legal team inside of a corporation is really seen as a cost center. That's a bit of a burden. Um, and we certainly want to kind of change that, transform that, you know, uh, adjust that to maybe say, hey, it's not a cost center, it's a value center. And how do we do that? Um, now, again, the interesting thing is when you feel that it's a cost center, a lot of times you are a little bit reluctant to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm already seen as a cost center and then I'm going to go and ask for extra funds to do this legal automation thing. Um, you know, I, I can definitely see the hesitance. However, as I said, this interesting Gartner study, when they flat out asked a bunch of executives about it, there isn't that sense. There is that sense of saying, hey, you know what? This is a business unit, just like any other business unit inside the organization, and it is worthy of investment. And frankly, if there's a way to invest and to get some kind of benefits out of it for the corporation, either cost savings or, or kind of pushing the, the company forward, that's a good thing. So again, I, I just want to, I thought this was fascinating research by Gartner, and I thought, that's a great place to, for us to all, all kind of start. So with that, whoops, let me go back. Um, why don't we start our panel discussion? And the panel discussion, the first question that I've got for the panel is, what is legal digital transformation? So I, I, you know, let's, let's just start with that. What, what does it mean to each one of you? And why don't I start with uh, uh, Michael, kind of tell me your perspective. Yeah, I guess so. I guess if you think about technology in general, uh, we implement technology in my mind to to solve problems of of resource and time, one one side of the uh, pillar, and then also to provide us with deeper data and insights into what we're doing. So I guess if you layer that over um, uh, the legal industry in general, we're really talking about um, the whole end to end cycle for an in house team specifically of how we're engaging with the business, what we're doing, and the way that we're reflecting on what we're doing. 
Um, so that's kind of meta management, meta intake, um, templates, uh, the, the output that we give to the business. And then so when we're thinking about, in my mind, technology and, and legal digital transformation, we're thinking about the tools that we can implement in different parts of that process to create um, efficiencies and scalability uh, so that we can pull ourselves out of more of the mundane work and yes. start to focus our minds on more of the high value ad work. Um, so, yeah, I guess the other side of the piece as well is then once we implement the technology to create those efficiencies, we need the technology to then be able to tell us, uh, produce the data for us to be able to see where we're spending our time, how we're spending our time, if we're spending it in the right places uh, and whether that's what we should be doing to help drive future decisions. Yeah, good perspective. Uh, that's great. Matt, how about your perspective on this? Digital transformation, what? Yeah, thank you, Charles. I, I think really um, feeding on from what Michael says, I, it, to me, it is actually, we, we use um, technology in all parts of our lives. I mean, certainly I've used Zoom and similar products more in the last two or three months than I had in the last two or three years. Um, and we realize how, how actually you can be efficient, how you can work on a, on a global basis. Um, and actually having the systems and processes in place that enables a global business to work efficiently, it all exists there, but are we using it as well as we can? Um, and I think um, the legal industry in-house teams have not always been um, at the forefront of uh, businesses in how you can actually use that technology. Sometimes, I mean, lawyers, we're all pretty conservative, um, I think, in our, in, our, in our thinking. But really, really, I think at the moment we're having to, we're having to use this technology and it's there. Um, and uh, for me, it's, it is actually about getting out of low value work. It's about being able, about health and wellness. It's about giving people the opportunity to focus on those things that, that really matter to a business and the more mundane aspects of, I mean, frankly, an in-house lawyer. I mean, I remember um, staying up till two o'clock in the morning doing some pretty mundane contracts and you think it's not good use of anyone's time. Um, and I think uh, uh, really shouldn't have to be there. People can do it. Businesses can do that far more efficiently. Um, and that would actually save money. So it's better for the lawyers, better for the business. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's uh, I think, what we can all do with at the moment. Yes, yes, agreed. Uh, actually, that's a good point. And Gordon, round us off. What, what, what's your feeling? What, what is digital transformation? Or I, I, I echo a lot of the points that Michael's made and Matt's made. And for me, you know, for those of us that can remember working in like the traditional offices where you used to have file, filing systems and somebody would create a matter and uh, there was lots of paper, lots of layers, lots of processes. Over the last 10 years I've worked in law, a lot of the things that used to happen in the value chain for legal and like giving legal advice have been streamlined through either technology solutions or improvements in processes. And when I think about transforming transforming legal, it's bringing it's bringing improvements to how businesses access legal, but also how the legal team itself operates. So making sure that the cogs inside the team itself are slick and that they're able to kind of dispense the advice and, and do their thing in an efficient way. And then that's also using using tools mm -hmm. where appropriate or other techniques to try and make life easy for the business. So okay. their interaction with legal is good. And then the lawyers are also able to smoothly dispense their, their mechanics, their advice in the best way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like the, the comments that kind of have uh, come out here about, you know, really kind of taking away some of the mundane work. And I, I've heard that a couple of times from a few other panels and a few other discussions on that same topic. Um, I like the, that concept also better for the lawyer, better for the company, you know, to be able to speed things up. And, and, and frankly, um, I think one of the other points, aside from efficiency, is also kind of really moving up the value chain to say, yeah, don't spend your time on those mundane tasks that can be automated. Spend your time on the more strategic elements, the, the stuff that's kind of important to the business, um, which so again, good, good, good resonation on that. Let me take you to the next question, which is um, uh, digital technologies uh, enable new types of innovation and creativity. So is this type of innovation just a nice to have or is it a must have in legal? You know, is it is it just the fact that we're going through the the pandemic at the moment? And frankly, once this is over, we're all going to go back to our offices and go back to normal. Or is this no? This is kind of important. And it's a, a strategic shift. And with that, I mean, Michael, why don't you start us off? Yeah. So, I mean, I've kind of reflected a little bit on this question. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a must have. I think legal teams of the future aren't just going to sit in the corner. Um, doing contracts and still expected to be a high contributing function of the business. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we need to find ways to pull ourselves out of the low value, um, high volume work that sucks up a lot of time. Anything we're doing that's repeatable, um, we sh like in my mind, we need to move towards not doing. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in my mind, therefore, it's, it's kind of a must have. But then stepping back a little bit, I think it is very um, team dependent, especially when you're thinking about in-house and you're thinking about where an in-house legal team is on its journey. There's no one size fits all technology in this market. And I think that's probably why you're seeing like it's quite hard to understand what technologies you should use at what stage of your evolution. So mm -hmm. I guess I would say I think the move towards technologies and the way that we can create efficiencies and scale inside in-house legal teams inside businesses mm -hmm. um, is a must have and it's the future. Um, but then finding the right technologies for the right time um, for your in-house team and where you're going is a really crucial step and not one that should be missed. Yeah, okay, that's good. That, that is a good point. Um, and uh, Gordon, let me throw it over to your side as well. So is yeah. it a nice to have or a must have? I My initial reaction was that it's 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 a good to have. Um, I, and I say that because I, I, I agree, like there's so many technology solutions out there now. Um, and it's very, for me, it's very easy to, to leap at a as, at a solution. For me, what's at the heart of it is understanding what the use case is first and foremost. So there's no point, um, you know, on just buying a piece of tech because it's a great piece of tech. It's actually got to fit into what the needs are of the team or the business and actually be solving a real problem. So my my initial reaction, you know, there are there will be some technology solutions that are out there that, that might not be right for a team or a business or what it needs at the moment. There's also a fair degree of fragmentation, I think, across different parts of the value chain. So it's it's important to take a step back and have a look at the whole the whole value chain and what the proposition is, what the use case is first and foremost. Because it might be that you you need to work with a different solution or there's a part of the problem that you're trying to solve that doesn't require a bit of tech. Maybe it does, but it's important to keep that in mind. I think that's that's a really important important point, Gordon. Mm -hmm. Um when you're looking at how to implement tools and to, to create efficiencies, you really need to know what the outcome is and you need to be outcomes driven because otherwise you might, like Gordon says, implementing a piece of technology for a problem that was never really a problem. No, I, I, I think that's actually a really, really good point that you guys hit on uh, directly. Yeah, you you know, at the end of the day, you're right. Um, I think there's like a, practically an infinite set of uh, different technology solutions. Well, okay, not, not quite, but at least a vast volume of them and uh, certainly you can't go and implement every single one. So I, I like that approach about really kind of focusing on what are the outcomes uh, for your your team and what's important to your team and your business overall, and then kind of mapping it back and saying, okay, well, here's how we get there. Uh, it's almost kind of creating a bit of a, a roadmap of some sort. Yeah, so that, that's good. Yeah, good answer. Yeah. Now, Charles, I was, yeah, sure. I was just because I, I think one of the things that it, it's important to me, we, we've all seen IT solutions in, in businesses which haven't necessarily been thought through in terms of no one's quite sure what is the business outcome. And I think lawyers are, lawyers are just the same. We've been in projects that, are, that, that we sort of sit in. Um, and I think it's about, to me, it really is about understanding what is the the need, what can be done more efficiently, whether for us or for the wider business. And I think it ties back to your comment that 73% of, uh, of execs are actually happy with this, mm -hmm. because I think they understand that law and legal teams can be more efficient yeah. um, and can do things better. And ultimately that makes their lives more efficient too, and the business. Yeah, 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 that's good. Well, excellent, thank you for uh, that kind of clarification, Matt. Uh, good. Now, actually, at this point in time, why don't we take a, a moment and do a, a poll question? So, Jonathan, if you could uh, pull that up, our first poll, and if we can ask the audience about what their opinion is. Uh, specifically, the, the first poll question is going to be, what is the obstacle that has kept you from legal digital transformation thus far? Now, if you're already down the journey and you kind of already are you know, digitally transforming, then that's a, um, uh, that's fine. Then think from the perspective of what do you perceive that is one of the biggest obstacles for uh, most legal departments in that respect. And uh, Jonathan, could you just confirm that you've got the poll up? Okay, yeah, I can see that, that the uh, poll is going up. And again, the options that you've got there are buy-in from leadership, uh, B is unsure of return on investment, uh, C was uh, not sure where to start, and then certainly um, T 
too time consuming is another option. And, and frankly, I mean, it might be just too confusing, period, overall. Um, so again, we'll give that a, about a moment or two and then see if we can uh, see the results. Let's give that uh, just a little bit more time. If everyone can just uh, enter your answer and then let's see what that comes out to. And Jonathan, do you think um, you can show the results at this point? Okay, there we go. So, um, is everybody else able to see the, uh, the the results thus far? Yeah. Okay. Good. So we're able to see now that. Okay. What is the obstacle that has kept you from legal digital transformation thus far? And it looks that the biggest one is buy-in from leadership. Huh. That's interesting. With fifty percent of the audience is kind of saying, "Hey, buy-in from leadership is a big thing," followed by unsure of the return on investment. Um, so that's actually really interesting, given that. Those were the two topics that we kind of started off with from the stats from the Gartner research, um, saying that, you know what, the return on investment typically on legal automation technology or contract automation technology is, um, you know, exceptionally high. It was like 89% um, basically reported uh, exceeding. Um, and then that other stat, about 73% of executives said that they were willing to back this up. So again, interesting perspective. It, Let's reflect on that for a second. Any any sense from from you guys, uh, Michael? What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think from the buy-in from leadership perspective, I know that this can obviously really really differ between companies and and mm -hmm. depending on where the legal team sits and the company structure as well, mm -hmm. how new it is, how engaged it is with the business. Um, so I fully appreciate that 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 can potentially be a tough one. I think though, when you're when you are really selling it to leadership, we have this you have this tension between uh, if you're inside a growing company, for instance, the level of work is going to continue to increase, but you're not going to get as many full-time heads to service that work um, as you necessarily need. So you're going to constantly be asked to do more with less. Um, yes. And I think framing up the argument in terms of if we figuring out, first of all, um, maybe what some of your repeatable tasks that you're doing are where you're spending your time, and then selling it to leadership in terms of, uh, well, hey, if we can implement X technology, I um, estimate that that'll take away X amount of work from my team, which mm -hmm. will free the current resources that we have up to be able to focus on the work that we have and the work that's coming. I think the other really key selling point for leadership is scaling with the business. So yeah. you might have a team that's capable of servicing the business needs today, but you need to be thinking about servicing the business needs in two to three years time mm -hmm. and not doing that by just adding more people to your team. Right. I think that's where technology becomes crucial and selling that argument becomes really crucial to leadership. Um, right. And if you're inside a technology company, that should be a really well understood um, um, piece of information, especially when we're talking about scalability. So that actually might be, you know, if you're going to make a recommendation to, to anybody, it might be to say, hey, do a little bit of a future looking pitch uh, yeah. to say, here's why we want to kind of get into this. Yes, maybe the beginning might be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, like any project challenging at the beginning, kind of getting adoption, et cetera, but this is going to pay dividends ultimately. That's right. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? Well, I was just going to say my reaction on that. I'm not sure if the return on investment, that's not a concept that, that comes naturally to all lawyers, mm -hmm. legal teams. And I think mm -hmm. what we found the hardest thing to do is to capture the value we're saving in some way so that we can offset like the, the solution we want to implement. It's going to cost, you know, and it's not, not mega bucks, but it's normally a considerable spend. And when you have that conversation with your CFO or your leadership team, they do want to see like, what are the metrics on it? Why are we implementing this solution? And can we not just do some other uh, short term hack that will save us the money? And th those are fair questions and fair challenges. But what we found helps overcome that. And when we've been working to build out a contract solution, it's to pinpoint the, the time that it would take for a team to do the task themselves or to somebody to sit at a desk and to review the documentation. And we've used a 
cost basis argument as a metric to say actually, but yes, the solution will be some outlay now, but it'll pay back its returns over three or four months. That would be my only reaction to conceptualizing what a good ROI is that doesn't always land well, it doesn't resonate with legal teams naturally. Yes. Okay. Interesting. That, 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 was, good. Yeah. that is a good perspective. Yes. Matt. I was, I was going to entirely agree with Gordon. I think it, it just shows to me that it's, I think it, the issue is actually about how well lawyers can articulate the argument because mm. it's not that lawyers don't want to do this because mm -hmm. if, if it was too time consuming or it wasn't seen as worthwhile then, then I think the poll would have come out differently but it's how do you actually articulate that because it seems that there's an open door that the execs if you can present the case that execs are generally very open to uh, to, to, to signing off. So therefore the issue must be more with the legal teams in terms of mm -hmm. how you write that business case in the first place mm -hmm. in order to actually demonstrate the benefits. Um, and one of the things that I've sort of seen in previous organizations is almost this feeling that somehow you can build it, build stuff yourself, even lawyers ending up building their own bits of technology and different teams building different bits because somehow mm -hmm. hours that people work is somehow not valued in the way that it's sort of somehow free and that's easier than writing a business case and I think probably what this says is that lawyers should think harder about how they can actually articulate it in order to get the benefits. Yeah that, uh, that, that is a really key point about the hours not being valued when it's internal yeah I've seen that over and over in, in companies not just in the legal area but certainly in, in different uh, functions as well so interesting points uh, that's good good so um let, let's move on with a couple more questions here. So digital transformation can be disruptive. Okay, for example, when you're introducing AI technology to your legal uh, process, um, uh, you know, it's disruptive for, for sure. There's no way of, uh, no other way to see it. Do you see these transformations augmenting jobs or replacing them? And I think that's, that speaks to the AI technology specifically. I've heard a lot of opinions about this and, and yeah, um, certainly, it's exciting stuff. It's new. It's it's uh, advanced technology. That's that's really cool. And there's always that scare factor beneath it, saying that, oh my gosh, you know, if we implement this thing, it's going to take away my job. Um, is it or is it not? And with that, what what Matt? Actually, why don't we start with you this time? What do you think? Well, I think uh, as 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 Mike was saying. I a lot of businesses are constantly expanding, they're growing. So mm. which point actually there is a requirement to be more efficient even within the team that you that you have because you're simply required to do more with the same resource. So, so it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to be taking heads out, but you need to be aware that the, 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 the capacity of the team is going to come under under more scrutiny. So, um, and, and to me, this is also about the wellness argument in terms of actually freeing time up for individuals as well in terms of not having to work silly hours so you so you and actually being able for example to job share better um, for example being able to pass work around a team um, in order to to avoid some of the low value work so it has all those sort of slightly intangible bases which of course then goes back in fact to how that it's sometimes hard to write the business case around that because business cases tend to be about we can save money because we need fewer people but um, you can also save money by not needing to overflow your work and spend so much money on 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 external law firms. So there are other ways that you can that you can actually demonstrate savings within a team, um, in order that actually that the business can train itself. So I think um, plenty of ways to to think about it. Frankly, uh, you know, I, I always think that given the amount of uh, the volume, the sheer volume of work that most lawyers and attorneys I've seen have been working. I, I don't think losing your job is really the big concern, but again, that's purely my opinion. Uh, Michael, let me throw it on onto your side. What, what do you think? Yeah, so I guess just following on, um, I think from my point of view, it's it's not technology is never about replacing job. It's jobs. It's about replacing repeatable tasks. Yes. So as we've already said over and over again, we can focus on the more high value add work. Um, and so from a like a zero example, we're a cloud accounting software. When we came into existence, there was a lot of questions around how do we manage to work so closely with accountants? We actually sell 80% um, of our products through accountants when a large part of what we do is replacing some of the services um, that, that they do uh, on a yearly, monthly basis. Um, and the answer to that, I guess, is, is we're not replacing what they do. We're actually enabling them to focus on higher value add services to their clients so that their clients can grow and then they can focus on growing their own business as well, which is ultimately better for the client, for them and for the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same applies to the legal industry. And I guess 
to, to put it frankly, if, if we're not innovative enough to um, be able to adapt the way that we work to be to providing those more high value ads in strategic services, mm-hmm. then then maybe we should be losing our jobs, <laughs> I guess. All right, that's good. Well, thank you. I, I like that concept about uh, specifically, and you've said it a couple of times, which I think is very, very, um, you know, a key message, which is replacing the repeatable tasks and replacing the mundane tasks and really kind of, I, and, and I believe you're right. This technology is really meant to kind of uh, get lawyers and attorneys really to be kind of moving up that value chain and and doing more strategic work, more business oriented work, which I think is uh, is absolutely the right approach. And that that's really what I believe that you know most AI technology is really kind of out to do anyway. Um, it's not. I don't think anybody kind of builds it with the intention of saying, "Hey, I want to take the job away from a lawyer." Mm, probably not going to happen. I don't. I don't see that happening anytime soon. But making the job much more interesting and kind of making you much more impactful for the company, I think that's where it really, really does kind of resonate, which is uh, which is good. So you, you've hit on a really key point. Um, let me throw out another question here. Um, so, for digital transformation to succeed in legal, you need to set well-defined outcomes. And that kind of comes back to one of the earlier questions. Uh, I think it was you, Michael, who mentioned that uh, the outcome side. So good. Now, what are some of the key metrics and KPIs that are important to all corporate legal teams? Tough, tough question. And with that one, because I, I know how diverse it can be. So, Gordon, let me pick on you. And why don't you start off the conversation on that one? What are some key KPIs that are important uh, you know, to any legal department? Sure. I, this is one that legal teams find really hard to to document, to conceptualize in a way that businesses understand it. Like what you're ultimately wanting to show is how you demonstrate value. Mm-hmm. And like the value of the lawyers for us, we've gone through this at TransferWise. It's, it's like a combination of a lot of things. It's it's about like the money that you're spending. And, you know, the business obviously sees the top line as what's going out. And then what we want to try and do is is like make us better at our jobs we call this like legal drag and um, and then we also want the organization to have less legal liability so we've come up with this way of like we think we can try and measure legal value looking at those three key aspects other organizations i've worked in it's you know it's been really hard it's like is it the number of filings we missed this quarter is it the number of contracts executed without a signature is it the is it because nobody wants it to be just on the money yeah. Um, or the headcount. So it's challenging for organizations to get to the bottom of how they measure value and how you build KPIs around the legal team. Yeah, tough question for sure. And uh, uh, Matt, let, let me get your opinion on that one. I, I was I was laughing actually listening to Gordon um, for exactly the same reasons. Um, trying to trying to get KPIs that work for lawyers that also work for a business. I mean, it's why. Um, so many law firms, even today, the only thing they can charge by is by the hour, because mm-hmm. apart from time, they really, even even law firms struggle actually to to to, to charge by value. Accountants have mm-hmm. worked it out, but lawyers haven't. Once you put that into an in-house team, when it's actually so much about supporting other parts of the business, being as efficient as possible, you you can of course have your turnaround times in terms of responding to a client in a certain amount of time helping the sales teams helping procurement whatever but it's 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 um it's very hard to articulate um but i think that people you understand it when you get it because it is actually about efficiency and it's then about the health and wellness of the team and that tends to be when people are doing good work they're doing good jobs Hmm. Um, and the rest of the business understands that the value is being created. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that actually, it's hard to measure, but I think a business knows when it's there. Um, and uh, I, I like, 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 like Gordon, struggle to articulate it in a different business I've worked out, worked in. People have tried different KPIs and mm-hmm. they shift every now and again, um, yeah. but it's hard. Just, just picking up from that, I think one piece that I've always thought of when it comes to KPIs and in-house teams, what I really wanted to steer away from implementing is KPIs around turnaround times, um, specifically because what what I think that an in-house team should be is a really key strategic business partner, not an outside and service provider. And the more KPIs that you set in place like that, the more you set yourself up looking kind of like an external law firm providing advice into the business. Um, I think what, what's really key for in-house legal teams is to show how you're driving the strategy and vision of the business. And that's a, a really, as the, Gordon um, and it might have said, it's a really difficult thing to, to show. And so I think one 
particular element though that that might be really relevant from a technological perspective is implementation of meta management um, systems or even tracking it yourself manually in terms of a bit of a heat mapping exercise to see where you spend your time um, what teams are taking most of your attention and whether the work that you're doing is aligned to um, specific strategic priorities of the business or not um, and I think that that's a really useful metric to help frame up what you should and shouldn't be doing as a legal team, but not KPI as such. Yeah, that, that actually is a really interesting idea, the heat mapping about where you're spending your time and such. That's uh, that's neat. Yeah, definitely uh, perhaps uh, one of the things that maybe more organizations need. And, and I would say that goes beyond just uh, legal uh, teams, but uh, but again, good, good recommendation on that. Excellent. At this point, actually, why don't we do another um, uh, audience uh, poll question? And Jonathan, if you could pull up the, the second poll question. So the second one um, is going to take us now into a little bit of more of a financial kind of direction, which is um, how long do you think it takes to recoup a financial investment in legal digital transformation technology? So and again, the options there are um, less than one year, one year to two years, basically one to two years or two to three years. What is the feeling from the audience? And again, you should see the poll questions up. We'll give everybody a moment to just kind of think about that. Um, what do you think is your financial, you know, as a financial investment on legal technology um, for digital transformation, what's that payback period? Well, while everybody's voting on that, I'm just going to put my hand up and say, I uh, didn't realize that I'd left a dressing gown in the background um, <laughs> of my working from home office. So apologies for that. Uh, well, that's that's neat. I hadn't noticed it personally, but uh, but that's uh, that's good. Now that you've mentioned it, we're not judging you, Michael. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> right. At least you at least you'd remember to take it off, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been worse. Could have been worse. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so it kind of looks like we are closing in on a two to three year period. Is uh, most of the audience forty six percent are saying two to three years is what that um, that payback period is. And the second most is one to two years. So again, yep, that's right. In fact, <clears throat> I was kind of thinking just before the webinar started that um, you remember that Gartner study that I, I referred back to, they actually did ask that as well. And I think that was of, um, hmm, it was either 300 or 500 um, uh, different corporations, uh, same thing of their legal teams in terms of legal automation technology and contract automation technology. And their answer came out to 2.4 years being their payback period. So again, pretty interesting just to reflect on that. And the audience actually seems to think pretty close to that as well, two to three years. And frankly, you know, anywhere from one to three years seems like a pretty reasonable uh, uh, period of time for that payback. So interesting perspective there. <clears throat> Now with that, why don't we go back and um, uh, into the next question, which is for digital transformation to succeed in, nope, I'm sorry, I already asked that one. The um, <clears throat> So let's reflect back on that uh, Gartner study. You remember what I had mentioned. I said that the uh, legal automation or contract automation had shown that 89% reported in their organizations that they either exceeded or they met ROI expectations. And then we also said that uh, a further 73% a of the executives said that they were extremely open uh, to further investments in legal, legal automation or contract automation technology. In that light, how would you best convince your executive team on the need for legal automation? So what's that key component that you're in front of the board, or you're in front of the uh, senior leadership team, what's it gonna take to be able to con convince them? And Gordon, why don't we, we start with yourself? Again, going back to the going back to the example of what you need, um, like metrics for us is key. You've got to have a really good and clear like data set to show the executive team like right. how this how this is going to add value and how it's actually going to you know picking up things like the ROI, the time it's going to save with business teams and the legal teams. For me, it's it's absolutely about the numbers and the organisation we're in particularly heightened, you know, when there's a lot of focus now on, on resourcing and, you know, trying to do more with less in these, in these, you know, unusual circumstances, right? Businesses have a lot of constraints. So you've got to have your numbers right. And you've got to be able to show that you have a strong use case for fixing a problem, that you've looked at other, other options, you've looked at other ways of trying to fix this, and this is actually the best solution for the business. Okay, that's good. So really, really kind of lay out the options and kind of say, this is this is what we need to be able to hit these targets. And this is the best solution that we found to be able to do that. 
How about you, Matt? What, what is your perception? Yeah, and, and I think um, it's also showing the benefits to the execs themselves. Mm -hmm. And a lot of execs travel all over the world, yet they're required on their phones or whatever to provide sign-offs, to take pretty instantaneous decisions. Um, and working, trying to giving, using technology in order to give the comfort to people who are being asked to sign off on contracts that really they may not have very much knowledge about. They don't, they haven't been involved in the process, but because mm. of something that's involved, um, they do actually, their, their level of approval is required for uh, under business delegations. The more that they know that it's been tracked properly, the security, the comfort of knowing that all the other lower down approvals have been obtained that the right efficiency has happened and that's all been recorded within a within a system gives them the level of comfort that actually if they've just done an airport or whatever they can click on their phone and go yeah that's fine in that knowledge that it, they're not just being asked on a whim um, and so i think you can actually play to senior execs um, that if you have the underlying technology to give that 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 gives them that comfort and security um, and i've also found that when you're working with other teams for example the sales teams uh, or the procurement divisions giving them systems in, in a way that they can integrate what they're doing with what we're doing so salesforce for example into um, e-signatures to actually make what they're doing as efficient as well helps the lawyers, but also helps their interaction with their clients, with the third parties, uh, prospects, um, what have you. So I think that it's actually not, it's better to not treat this solely as a legal issue, but actually broader within the business. And what I've also found is that those other areas tend to have far larger budgets than the lawyers do. So if you can actually get them to somehow think that it's their idea, then they'll end up funding, helping you with the funding. Oh, I like that idea. That's a, that's a clever tactic. <laughs> it, it's always nicer to use somebody else's money. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. That, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, and I, I do think that you, you hit on a really important topic. I mean, if there's an opportunity to be able to partner with one of the other teams and certainly being able to express that business value to the other executives, cool. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, uh, the nice little uh, line up also about saying, hey, if, if they think they thought up this idea, even better. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you want the outcome, which is like you've got the new system, which is helping your team get better, faster, et cetera. That, that's uh, that's key. Uh, Michael, let me throw it over to you as well. Yeah, not too much more to add than what we discussed earlier and yeah. um, what Matt and Gordon have already said, but mostly just really focusing on justifying the investment. So re really giving a clear picture on what it is that you do today that can be solved um, and then giving the two to three year view. Um, mm -hmm. If it's not solved, how many more people you might need in your team to be mm -hmm. able to continue to operate in the way that you're operating. And then you've got a really clear, uh, two clear points in which to show if we do implement X technology or Y technology or streamline this process, um, this is how much time can be saved. And that actually becomes a financial gain for the business in the long term. Right. Um, so yeah, justifying the investment from start to finish and where you want to be in a few years time, I think is yeah. really key. Good perspective. So let me round off with uh, maybe one of our last questions between, before we kind of open it up to the audience for any last uh, kind of uh, questions from there as well. Um, so one of my final questions here is before you start a legal digital transformation project uh, uh, in your legal practices, in, in your company, what are two things that every GC should be doing? So in other words, think back to before you started your own digital transformation projects in your companies and just say, hey, I kind of wish that I had done this. You know, so two things I'm looking for each one of you. What do you think? I, I can jump in first there, yeah, guys. Um, so I think one we've already touched on quite a bit, which is define the outcomes. Define the outcomes that you're trying to achieve or you'll go down a rabbit hole um, that you won't be able to come out of um, and solve for problems that aren't necessarily problems. Uh, two, um, and I'm going to be cheeky here and say three, I think, because um, three is a better number. Um, uh, two, canvas the business for how oh, yeah. you engage with them um, how they would like to engage with legal, but also um, for their experiences and implementation of technology in their teams. You've got to assume that there's other people around the business who have done digital transformation projects and mm -hmm. are good at it. And mm -hmm. you can really, um, uh, I think, tap into the, that, those learnings instead of trying to reinvent the wheel yourself as an in-house legal team. Mm -hmm. um, and then three, uh, and one I think is really, really important is to, to look at the technologies that your company is using um, and try and gel with those as much as you can. The last thing you want to do is introduce some really different clunky piece of software that, that doesn't um, integrate with any of your current systems. 
uh, because then you're kind of creating this this technology off to the side that people have to engage with and that they might not want to. So to the extent that you can think about how you can utilize current technologies with new um, legal tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think you're hitting on a really important part. The integrations are sometimes absolutely key just to kind of get, even just getting adoption inside the company. So that's good. Uh, anyway, let, let me not say anything else in case I'm taking another point away. Uh, Matt, why don't we flip it over to you? What, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think it was sort of a point of but it's actually working out what it is that you want to automate. It's actually that existential question. What is it that you actually want to, the outcomes are, but what is it that we're trying to do? Um, and be, but the second thing is actually about forcing the business uh, and the team to really work things like approval processes out, work out, making sure that all your precedents are in good state. Because in a lot of the th um, even pretty big corporations I've worked in, some of that stuff is not as good as it should be. Um, and it's like anything, if you start to automate something that's a bit or has been stuck together with sticking plasters in the first place, actually get your house in order first so that you've actually done the work so you've got something that's clean and then you can then automate it and from then on you get the really get the benefits of the uh, of, of an efficient organization rather than something that's a little bit cobbled together yeah that, that's a really good point uh, work out the processes that's um I, you know i i find a lot of times it's there there is a temptation to jump in uh, I mean, you know, there's that excitement, there's that uh, a certain momentum that you've kind of built up and stuff and people kind of want to just, hey, dive in, bring this thing on, let, let's get moving with this thing, I want to start using it already. But it's a really good point that you just made in terms of saying, yeah, actually, it's, it's almost one of those chicken and egg questions, which is, should I fix the process first or do we deploy the technology? And, and kind of you almost really have to do both the, a little bit, in, but not to forget that, hey, the process, either you should get that, you know, uh, ramped up or kind of you know fixed up uh, or be expecting that you're going to be adjusting it uh, along the way as well and that's an easy point for a lot of people to forget that the uh, process is so so important um, and and again it's not just legal it's across the corporations but you know specific to us and legal for sure good and Gordon what, what are your think and thoughts on this what do you wish you had done what are the two points on your side I'm gonna, I'm gonna be cheeky and, and do three because Michael okay can't. awesome um, <laughs> not to be one up <laughs> knowing knowing and knowing and finding your stakeholders I think stakeholder engagement is critical to any project so if you if you think you've got everybody on board with your project assume that you haven't there'll be other teams that you'll need to get buy-in from who may have an interest in the technology so it's not just about the team you want to implement the technology for it's everyone from your finance team, your IT, existing tech uh, solutions within the business and the, the teams that own those things. And bringing them on board with you to implement digital change is, don't underestimate how, how challenging that can be, but mm -hmm. if you have them on board, it's gonna go a lot smoother and faster. And then, you know, that like Mike was said, the technology that's there, we did, we like looked at the market to try and get some stuff in and we found actually, do you know, we can build something very simple off the back of um, Jira, right? Using a, a tool that was already, already there in place. So explore what your organization uses already. If you've got Slack, there's lots of other things you can do to build notifications and to share know-how into your organizations. That's one thing that we looked at. And then the other point is, so the final point, have your use case very clear, right? Yes. So make sure you've done your research, you have you know what problem you're solving, like Michael said, don't solve for problems that don't exist. But if you do have a strong use case, that'll get you over the line to getting stakeholders on board. Yeah, yeah, so actually some really, really key points. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. I mean, uh, define your outcomes, I think, is a, a resonant thing that comes keeps coming up. Uh, you know, uh, canvas the, the business. Uh, so in other words, you know, get that that feedback from from your partners, from the other business units as well. Make sure that they're they're kind of integrated with this. I think that helps a lot with the adoption. Um, you know, figuring out what you want to automate and what what processes as well. So again, some really really key points here. That that's that's awesome and and some good pointers for the audience for sure. For anybody who hasn't already kind of uh, gone down this path and, and started their own journey. So good. Now with that, let me just sort of flip back to. Slides. There's our slide on uh, looking at the, the, that Gartner study we talked about. So I do want to kind of thank everybody, first of all, and, and also just say a couple of comments. Um, so from our side, if, um, you know, one of the things, of course, is if you are looking at a digital transformation process uh, within your own company, specific to the contract management space, that's a big chunk of what a lot of companies are doing these days. Very, very um, popular because it's a place that we, you know, um, a lot of companies are finding that is 
the legal processes are really helping their 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 legal departments and their business overall considerably. Uh, please do reach out to us. I mean, uh, we're Contract Pod AI. Uh, we do this, you know, kind of for a living. Uh, our CLM is one of the best in the industry, and we actually also really really pride ourselves specifically about the. Um, a digital transformation process. So we have a very nice process in place. In fact, that's what we're showing on the slide there, um, getting you, uh, we kind of think of it in three kind of big chunks or big kind of areas. One is getting you transformation ready. So assessing where you're at, you know, the outcomes, we talked about the outcomes uh, a little bit earlier, for sure that that popped up a lot and actually having a bit of a blueprint to say, how do I get from where we're at to where we have to get to or where my outcomes are. The other thing is the transformation delivery process itself. Again, we talked on this panel about integration and being so key. Um, you know, that's one of the areas that we think it's very important for a vendor to be able to help there and be there with you every step of the way. And then finally, at the end, you know, don't forget the transformation success. How do you get that adoption going, et cetera? And then what happens after it's already kind of deployed, making sure that you've got a customer success team there to help you uh, along the way every once in a while when there, when there are things that you just have to come back and say, hey, could you train us a little bit more on this? Or, or how do I adjust this, uh, this element, et cetera? So again, um, you know, do, do look for that. The other thing as well that, hey, I'm gonna mention also is um, when you're going down this journey, one of the things that everybody's excited about is getting the process running quickly. And one of the very, very key elements is making sure that you've got some of those early successes on a digital transformation process. Um, we pride ourselves in being able to kind of get up a CLM within 10 days up and operating, which is great uh, for 500 critical contracts. Again, uh, very important from a lot of the customers who have worked with us we found that this is really, really key elements. And again, we just want to kind of throw that out there. So again, if you are looking for to start your digital transformation process uh, and journey, uh, you know, reach out to us, Contract Pod AI. We're here and love to help. And with that, um, the two things that I'll do is one, certainly open it up to the audience. But but before I do that, I do want to thank my panelists. Thank you so much. You guys have been absolutely wonderful. Very insightful thoughts in terms of what uh, uh, you know what we should be doing, and uh, you know everything from really raising the the level of what the attorney and what the legal department should be doing, kind of raising the value of that department from you know doing a lot of times it is the mundane, a lot of the uh, you know tons of the work to much higher value, much uh, you know higher business value for the corporation. So, in fact, there is one question coming out here. Uh, oh, no, sorry, that person's just telling us that they have to drop. Um, some good feedback there, uh, excellent, and, and a, a note to the Kiwi colleagues. So, good, good to hear on that side. Are there any questions from the audience? Again, please feel free to, to throw it into the chat right now. Okay. Well, with that, in that case, I will again say thank you, gentlemen. It has been a very insightful session, and we will be posting this actually on the Contract Pod AI website uh, within the next couple of days. So, if you do have any, um, if you wanted to come back and kind of um, relook at some of the notes or, or um, jot down some of the other thoughts in terms that maybe you didn't kind of uh, jot down quickly enough, feel free to do that. Uh, we also will send a copy of the presentation to all those people who have, we'll send a copy of the presentation to all those people who have attended this webinar. So again, thank you everyone for attending and we will see you on the next one. Thanks, Charles. Thanks guys. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, see you guys. Thank you.